That is so unfair. Uh, uh, welcome to the Climbing Ayer 1978 channel or 1978, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Uh, uh, anyway. Hello ladies and gents, welcome to my YouTube channel, Climinator1978 or 1978, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Today I'm going to be reviewing a film that was released 22, no, uh, scratch that, it'll be 23 years ago this year. But I've only just watched it for the first time Literally, this afternoon, I watched it for the first time. Now, when I say it's a comedy film, don't go running away thinking that this is a classic. You know, this is not uh, among the greats of, like, Carry On or or um, something like Norman Wisdom. However, it's actually better than I thought it would be. But there are still a lot of issues with it. This film is a feature film based on a sketch show character that I grew up absolutely loving to watch from the uh, 1990s. He had um, a partner in crime with him all the time. They are the characters Kevin and Perry. And the film I watched today was Kevin and Perry Go Large. Now, I vaguely remember the film coming out. It was around about Easter time over here in the year 2000. Now, you, you may be wondering why I didn't go and watch the film on the big screen. That is because I come from a family where if you're not old enough to see it, you don't go and see it. Otherwise, you're banned from your games consoles. That's how I was raised. And of course, taking my PlayStation or my Nintendo away from me is like putting kryptonite in front of Superman. In other words, it was lethal. But anyway... I was in my mid-teens at the time and the age restriction on this film was one year above me. One year above me. Anyway, I grew up loving Kevin and Perry. I loved their sketches. I... You know, I just thought they were hilarious. Do I think they're as hilarious today? Not so much, but I still love the sketches. The film, however, whilst not perfect, is still okay for a guilty pleasure. The problem I do have with it, though, is that there is a lot of gross-out humour. Now, I don't mind gross-out humour, but when I say there's a lot of gross-out humour, I mean, it's really one particular joke about erections. Now, you know, I could take that kind of joke about once, twice, maybe even three times in a film. But when it's about seven or eight times in a film, I'm like, yeah, that is massive overuse on the one joke. There are plenty of other jokes as well, don't get me wrong. And there's plenty of other funny moments in the film. And thankfully, the film is rather short. It's only about an hour and 20 minutes, counting end credits. 
But basically, that gag itself is massively overused. And I know that there are so many over PC people today that would say, oh, the women are treated like, you know, playthings and all that. But that is the whole point of Kevin and Perry, you see. The defence of the film is that the point of Kevin and Perry is that they are a couple of sex-mad lads. They don't see anything beyond that narrative. Anyway, the plot of the film is that Kevin and Perry get the idea that they don't want to just become DJs, but they want to go to Ibiza because all the gorgeous-looking women out there have it off with a DJ. And the thing is, their school holidays are approaching and they flunk their GCSEs meaning they have difficulty finding a job. So this leads to Kevin and Perry being able to go to Ibiza. However, there's a problem. They only get to go to Ibiza with Kevin's parents tagging along, much to Kevin's dismay. And... The thing is, when they land in Ibiza, Kevin and Perry begin to go off and do their own thing. And they see all these gorgeous looking women everywhere in bikinis and all that. And they think they're in heaven. And they come across this big star DJ played by Reese Iphons. And he's a vicious creeper around women. And he treats Kevin and Perry like absolute shit. And he is obviously the antagonist of the film. You know, there's no big twist or anything. And there's no big surprise in the film. But it's basically about, well, there are a couple of poignant moments in the film, especially towards the third act. And there's a lot of recognisable faces, but getting back to the poignant moments and the plot itself, it's basically about Kevin realising that he's now got to grow up as he's approaching 18. And I thought that's actually a decent move in the plot. Because that's not, you know, totally unbelievable for Kevin and Perry. You know, the whole, you know, the sketch show series showed Kevin becoming a teenager at first, going from being an annoying junior school kid type who's ever so annoying and then becoming this awkward teenager (sighs) and then the film itself is basically about Kevin realising that one day he will have to take on responsibility for his actions and Perry begins to respond to this as well. I'm probably thinking a little bit too deeply about this, but... (laughs) It's not an incredibly deep film, and it's just something to put on in the background. And I remember when the film came out, it got 
absolutely slaughtered by critics. And I think that was a bit unfair, to be honest. Because the thing about critics is that they can slaughter a film like Kevin and Perry, but the audiences will go and see it in masses. But then critics will say, go and see a film like Love, Honour and Obey, a Shakespeare film, which came out roughly around the same time, I recall. And they'll say, oh, it's the greatest film ever. Beautiful, beautiful film. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And hardly anyone will go and see it. Now, it may be a beautiful film. And I dare say it was. I mean, it had my all-time crush in there at the time, Alicia Silverstone. But it's a film that just wouldn't interest me. No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Alicia. And I'm William Shakespeare. (laughs) Sorry, that was a Kevin moment coming out in me. I guess I've never quite got rid of that element to a degree. But no, my point is, critics sometimes can be too harsh on a film. And they don't see what the context or content of the original source material actually is. But, yeah... I think it's a well-made production, and there's a lot of recognisable faces, as I said. Phil Mitchell himself actually turns up in the film at one point. Steve McFadden. He has like a 10-second cameo in the film. Paul Whitehouse is in the film as well, and um, there's quite a lot uh, quite a lot of recognisable faces. Uh, um uh, Tom Courtney is Kevin's dad, and yet he was never his dad in the uh, sketch show. He was two other geezers. But, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of funny moments, including a part where Kevin accidentally foils a bank robbery. I'm not going to go into specifics, <laughs> but it made me chuckle. Anyway, that's my review on Kevin and Perry Go Large. A reasonably funny film. Um, was it, If it was re-screened down the uh, Odeon, would I go and see it? I might. But then I might just go and get the DVD. But then I'm a fan of Kevin and Perry. It all all depends on what mood I'm in. So this film is going in the doorway to limbo. Take care and I hope you all have a good day. Bye.